Now we're going to go to our final speaker of the block, who is uh, Dr. Leif Nissen Lundbeck, CTO of Exane. Leif. Um, right. Uh, it's the last slide for some reason. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I don't know why it doesn't work. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> doesn't work at all. Okay. Yeah, so um, yeah, first of all, uh, many thanks for um, being here. And uh, my name is uh, Leif Lundbeek. Um, I'm the CEO of Xane and one of the co founders. Uh, and at Xane, um, we focus um, especially on trusted access control protocols. Uh, so, not, not so much really on payment protocols, but solving really the problem that um, when you actually have such distributed systems, and also interact with centralized systems, you actually also need to solve the problem of giving permissions to other um, organizations, for example, or to other um, people. And um, so, I hope it works now. What? Okay, perfect. So yeah, um, starting actually also in the field of IoT, of course, IoT gives us a lot of promises. So, of course, we can build intelligent applications on top of many protocols of systems. Um, we can, of course, interact with multiple devices and actually, of course, build interoperable systems to actually solve certain problems of people that can actually then access these devices in a very fine-grained matter. However, actually, it's not that fine-grained and also delegation of policies really is a problem here because many systems actually just fake the control. So people have the illusion to have control over the data and their devices, but actually it's only in the control of platforms, such as, for example, Amazon Key, or of course in the recent example of Facebook, you only have the impression that you actually as a user have control, but actually the authority controls everything in their environment. Um, and this, of course, leads to limited interoperabilities between different um, systems as they are extremely centralized and of course, don't really allow um, much trust in these systems. So currently, many of these systems are authority-managed access control systems. So you can see on the left side um, that there is a central authority controlling and hosting, of course, the resources. And the resource owner is, of course, just giving permissions to um, the authority to manage this. And the authority is then, in their databases, for example, faking this control. So some systems are, for example, called golden key systems here. Uh, of course, this is a huge problem. And um, already 10 years ago, user-managed uh, access um, systems were created, um, for example, OAuth um, and OAuth2 um, under UMA. Uh, and they try to solve this problem also of portability of access control. So you have a resource owner that is giving, for example, an access token to someone else, which integrates certain policies. And these certain policies can then, of course, be used by um, that person. And you sign this transaction. The problem, however, with these systems is that, um, first of all, you don't really have much fine-grained control when it comes to shared economies in IoT. So, one example is I give access to someone else to my car and that person is then renting out this car again. I have no possibility of actually controlling what um, the third party is actually doing with my car. So this is, um, this is the first problem here which OAuth2 is not solving and it also has very limited possibilities of actually handling fine-grained control here. The second problem is that OAuth2 systems are not really run on shared infrastructures. So, um, and if they are run on shared infrastructures, you have no possibility of actually trusting whatever policy you integrate here. And of course, this limits, of course, then that you actually don't have fine-grained policies because you cannot trust them at all anyway. And the third problem is in these systems that when you actually interact with devices, you have no um, ability of actually controlling that this device is not, for example, um, DDoSed. 
This means that, for example, in um, keyless go systems, which uh, certain um, autom automotive manufacturers have implemented, um, it was easily possible to attack these systems and um, to, for example, um, force them to restart, and while restarting, of course, attacking them again and hacking into these systems. So for this, um, most of these systems run through centralized servers and only offer online communication which of course limits the applic um, applicability of these systems a lot. So you have, um, for example, in, um, in car parks or in your garage, you, you have no um, ability to actually open your car, or of course not um, being able to share your car. So this of course limits then, at the end, um, how you can actually use these systems. And the problem here is actually that each of these attacks is almost costless. So you have no incentivization of actually behaving in a, um, in a good manner. So the solution that, um, that we offer here in our protocol is um, that we expand the UMA protocol um, to in a decentralized manner. So you have actually also different architecture at the end where a resource owner is storing its policies and actually these policies become a domain-specific language so that you actually can write our program own policies and store them in a decentralized manner of a um, decentralized network at the end. Um, and then, um, as you can see on the right side here, for example, a requester can access such um, uh, decision points, um, and through these decision points, I'll also retrieve some attributes that have been collected pr um, previously from the devices. Such attributes can be, of course, um, how this um, device was used, um, and certain sensor data, and this, of course, means also that um, the resource owner can then manage whatever has happened here before and can actually also prove it. Um, and through decentralization and a consensus mechanism, it is also possible to prove that your policies have not been manipulated before. And to have like a standardized way of writing such policies and to delegate these policies is extremely important when it comes to IoT and shared economies. So how does the protocol work at the end? So um, from a technical architecture um, point of view, um, we implemented the system um, first with different um, OEMs um, where we have a user device. Um, this can be, for example, a speech, uh, speech recognition system, can be also an app, of course, um, where you generate, of course, an, an ID. Um, but also we have an embedded compilation entity which is running, for example, on a microcontroller. Um, and this, of course, becomes also an, uh, become, um, yeah, well, gets also um, a known ID at the end. Um, and on this embedded uh, compilation entity, there is an embedded client, and this embedded client is kind of like a light client, but in a way that actually also validates um, the um, policy stores. And these policy stores um, store, act at the end, all policies and all attributes. They can be the same, but can be also different ones. So um, we integrate this protocol currently in different protocols, for example, Ethereum, IOTA, and Hyperledger. So um, in some ways, um, policy and attribute stores are the same. Um, and they, of course, validate um, then, of course, also the embedded clients. Um, and when you, as a, as a client or as a, as a user, want to, for example, share your car, you integrate um, and broadcast um, this policy, how to use your car, and broadcast this to the um, full clients, and then your um, car receives these updates um, eventually as well. So one example is here um, the device sharing example, where you, for example, want to share your device with a friend, so you update a policy how to use this, and then the friend, um, which is um, in the middle graphic, um, can access um, and open this car, for example, and use it in a certain way. Um, and every interaction with your car gets locked and also stored in a distributed way. So you can actually also prove um, how he actually behaved. Um, and on the third example, um, we also have the possibility um, for offline communication and limited access. So one example is here um, that you drive um, in a car park, you go shopping um, and you ask the shop assistant um, to put your bags um, in the trunk of your car. Um, so you give him um, a limited access basically to the car and this access is then burned by the car. Um, and of course, every interaction gets then locked again. Um, 
A second example is actually the delegation of policies. And this is, of course, much more complex because we can have actually uh, n type of parties here that come in a row. So one example here is um, that ha we have a producer, an OEM, for example, um, Porsche, um, and we have a car dealer that actually sells the car or leases the car, and we have a leaseholder then, and the leaseholder is again using this car in a shared um, economy to actually share it with other people. So in this scenario, usually the OEM has no control at all over what the user at the end is actually doing with the car. However, um, the OEM is still owning some of the software inside the car and also need to maintain, for example, some of the software um, through updates, for example. And um, by the behavior of the user, this can, of course, limit um, a lot what the producer can at the end do. So the um, producer needs to still make sure that um, the user at the end is really behaving in a certain way. And here, um, all this process runs on the shared infrastructure on these policy stores, um, where the OEM can, of course, then integrate certain control um, functionalities, certain policies, and delegate them. And through this um, protocol, then also make sure that the user is actually behaving in this way and not differently. And the third example um, is um, that, um, of course, each of these OEMs is currently using um, or trying to integrate different um, blockchain protocols, for example, or just having centralized systems like an Oracle database. And um, the problem becomes at the end um, that the interoperability between these systems is again extremely limited. And also, if you, for example, write certain commands um, in each of these um, protocols, you also need to make sure that you can actually execute these commands inside the car. And it's not about only receiving data through um, OBD dongles, for example, um, which is, of course, like just a simple transaction to um, gather data and store it somewhere in a decentralized manner. I mean, that's quite simple. Um, it's much more complex to actually also grant um, access, for example, to certain functionalities inside the car and also make sure that these um, processes and methods are actually authenticated, validated, and then eventually executed, and that you actually make sure that you know whatever has been executed here. Um, and for this, um, we, um, we started with Ethereum, actually, to integrate our protocol in Ethereum, kind of in a similar manner as Lightning Protocol, um, just for access control. Um, but, of course, it makes sense um, also to, to um, expand this to further protocols. So, therefore, we are currently also working together with other um, systems here, with IOTA and um, Hyperledger, to also make sure that uh, our domain-specific language is actually integratable in these language, uh, different systems and protocols, and also programmable um, in a certain manner that actually the embedded clients can enforce also certain executions whenever um, certain ex uh, commands come and wherever they come from. For example, you can write then with an IOTA smart contract the same command as you can also write uh, in Ethereum then. So um, all of these um, kind of like um, examples, um, we also integrated then um, with Porsche together um, in a pilot project. Um, so you can see here in the picture that um, uh, we um, developed the embedded client inside then the car to actually also enforce um, these commands and to make sure that these commands can then actually also be um, executed. So online you can also find a video um, where we show um, what we've done there and, and how we've done it. Um, and in this example, we had um, three epics. Um, one of the epics was um, sharing actually your car um, with your family, for example, because um, Porsches will um, usually not be um, used in a sharing economy that much. Um, but um, that, that was basically first one epic. Another epic, epic um, was um, audible data trails, of course, um, because that's actually what the car produces here. It's roughly 10 gigabytes um, per day. And then um, it's, of course, also a question what do you do with this data, and whom do you give access to this data? Uh, and if I go, go back um, to, to this slide, then um, one, th one thing that you can actually do here as well is that you can, for example, um, write commands to ask, for example, users of a different um, car holder um, to also share data with you. For example, Porsche has not really many cars uh, on the market. While Volkswagen, for example, has um, millions of cars in the market. So it becomes really um, interesting for Porsche also to ask Volkswagen users to share data with them. For example, to um, uh, develop intelligent applications on top, um, where, of course, the ma mass of data is really important. On the other way, 
um, Volkswagen can be extremely interested um, on data from Porsche. And data from Porsche is um, very valuable as they have um, high-definition sensors, so they can build um, HD mapping applications on top. The direct way of Volkswagen asking Porsche is in this case not possible, of course, due to um, regulation. So asking the user is here the obvious choice. Um, and another example is um, third-party integration. So um, DHL, as a, um, for example, in this um, trunk delivery case, um, was integrated here. So you can, for example, deliver um, tr parcels um, in your trunk. So the advantage of, of, the, of um, such kind of protocols is that you can actually develop fine-grained access control commands um, to access, um, for example, um, certain devices and to make this really usable for human-to-machine interactions, but also at the end for machine-to-machine -machine interactions. The second advantage is um, that it as a domain-specific language is actually programmable also for other protocols. And the third advantage um, is that the secure offline or near-field communication, of course, also expands the way you can actually use it um, instead of just having like a single server sitting somewhere and using online communication to, um, to ask for access. So just as a, um, a few information um, about uh, Xane, so um, these are the founders. Um, we're roughly 35 people um, right now. Um, so we founded to, I founded it together with uh, Michael Hood uh, as a CTO and Felix Harman as COO. Um, and uh, we were created in 2014 uh, at the University of Oxford, first as a pure research project. Um, we kind of like um, developed more into um, a corporation uh, at this time, working mostly together with um, Daimler um, and uh, other corporations in the um, automotive field. Um, had a first um, successful pilot system, which took um, quite a long time um, to integrate this protocol um, in actual uh, manufacturing processes um, at Mercedes. And um, in the beginning of this year, also launched um, the um, vehicle network, where actually you have embedded enforcements of policies um, in cars, um, together with Porsche. Uh, and we just created also um, the foundation um, that basically holds all the open source code. So our main clients are here, um, Porsche, Volkswagen, uh, and Daimler. Um, and yeah, I actually um, would also like to, to offer you to join, really, um, to create um, such uh, integrations um, to actually write also sec secure access control um, commands and delegation protocols. Thank you very much.